The single tool that I use most in my work is the table saw. Well, maybe the pencil, but I don't really know too many pencil jigs, so let's talk about table saws. All right, so I'm still gonna be using my main saw, the SawStop PCS, the bulk of the time, but you're probably gonna see more and more of this saw in the coming months and years, my job site saw. And while these saws are great right out of the box, to get the most of them, and really any table saw, you're gonna wanna build or buy some jigs and accessories. Probably a combination of the two. So while I was making the ones that I use the most for this saw, I thought I'd go over my favorites and how to make them. So let's get into it. First up is the crosscut sled. Now I'm not gonna be giving dimensions here because it's all relative to your particular table saw, but all the basics should apply to pretty much any saw. And also I should say that this is kind of a watered down version of the sled that David Picciuto built on his channel and he goes over it in a lot more detail, so I'll throw a link to his video in the description also. So you're gonna start by cutting out a large rectangle that's gonna be the base for everything. I like to make mine as big as I can get away with, reasonably, and that way I have the most room to work on it when I'm using it in the future. Next I'm gonna use some hardwood, so here I'm using maple, to make some runners that'll fit in the miter slots. I'll be making a pair, one for each slot. And I think that the best way to do this is air on the side of too big and then just keep removing material until it's just big enough to not have any play but so that they can still slide freely within the miter slot. Also you're going to want to make sure that they're just a little bit thinner than your miter slots are deep. That way they don't touch the bottom. Next I'm going to take some pennies and put them in the slots to hold the runners proud of the surface of the table saw. And then I can place my base on top of that and with a little glue and some weight, hold everything together while it dries a little bit. And just to make sure that I'm pretty close to square at this point, you can see that I'm referencing my fence on one edge. So after the glue was pretty dry, I came back and installed some screws through the runners and into the base. And actually, it's probably better to do this the other way where you're going from the top side, so from the base into the runners, but this seemed to work for me, so. I don't know, maybe it doesn't make a difference after all. All right, going back in time a couple minutes, while this was setting up, I also ripped out a couple of strips of plywood and that's gonna become the back fence of my sled. Basically the part that the workpiece rests on and that you'll be holding to maneuver the sled. So I laminated two pieces together and after they were dry, I used the table saw to trim them flush and then put a 45 degree bevel on what'll become the front bottom face. And this is so that debris doesn't get in the way while you're trying to use it as a reference, which could throw off crucial measurements. The next step is to attach the fence to the sled. So here I'm just using one screw at one corner. And then what I'm going to do is raise my blade through the table to make a line. And you can see here I'm making sure to remove my splitter before I do this. And actually, I guess now's a good time to mention that that's my number two accessory. So most table saws should come with a splitter. I think it might even be a requirement, but even if it is, it wasn't always. So you could have an older table saw that might not have one. And honestly, I think it's the single most important safety feature of a saw. So if yours doesn't have one, there are ways that you can retrofit one in. I know that Microjigs make some that you can fit into the throat plate. So yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna go over it in too much detail. I'll just say that that's something that you should definitely be aware of and make sure that you have and use one. Okay, back to the sled. So now here I'm raising my blade and making a cut through just the table and I don't want to go into my fence yet at this point. So now I can use that line that I just cut and a square to get my fence really really close to perpendicular with the blade in the miter slot. So once I feel like I'm there I'm going to clamp it down to hold it and then insert one screw on the opposite end and then I can test it out to see how close to perpendicular it is. And while I'm doing that, it gives me a chance to mention something else that I think is really important when you're working with a table saw, or well, really any power tool for that matter. And that's being alert. And I think one of the best ways to make sure you stay alert is with coffee. And one of the best ways to get coffee is with Trade Coffee. So Trade's mission is to turn coffee drinkers into coffee lovers. And I'll be the first to admit that I am not an expert when it comes to coffee. I really only started drinking it with regularity this year but that's actually one of the coolest and my favorite things about Trade Coffee. When you go to their site, you can take a quick six question quiz about the flavors you prefer, how you plan on making it and so forth. And at the end, they'll match you up with a coffee that fits your preferences. So if you're like me and you're really trying to figure out your tastes still, this is perfect. 
and honestly, even if you already are a coffee lover, it's still a really good way to expand your horizons. So my perfect match was called Ad Astra Signature Blend from Petey's, which you can see here they describe as comforting and rich, just like I like my women. All right, so all joking aside, I think they nailed it. I've been drinking it for a couple weeks now, and I don't know what else to say other than I actually really, really like it. But that said, I do want to try some others once I finish this bag because, well, why not? But anyhow, here's the best news. So right now, Trade is going to give away the first 100 people who click the link below 50% off of their first order. So just click the link in the description and use the code 4 eyes. Alright, thanks Trade Coffee. Okay, so back to testing out my sled. So somebody can probably explain this better, but here what I'm doing is making a cut and then rotating my piece so that the most recently cut edge becomes the reference face on the next cut. And by doing that five times, I'm basically compounding any discrepancy so that it's magnified. Now, I don't know if I got lucky, but when I measured my piece, it was pretty much dead on. So once you have it to the point where you're happy, I could insert a few more screws and lock things up. And again, David's video is going to get a lot more into the nitty gritty of this kind of sled and how to adjust things if you're off. So if you are going to build one of these, I highly recommend checking out that video. Again, I'll link it below. And one last thing to mention, attaching another piece to the opposite end of the sled is optional, I guess. It makes it more rigid, I would say, but it could get in the way of potential cuts, so just decide what's best for you. So the awesome thing about this sort of a crosscut sled is that you know that it's at a perfect 90. No need to fuss around with it whenever you get it out. And so if you want to quickly cut one piece or several at the exact same length, a crosscut sled is just about the best option. But there are a couple of other tools out there that are also on my list that are pretty similar. One that you've seen me use a lot on my channel is the Rockler crosscut sled. Incra makes a similar one as well, but I've never used it, so I'll talk specifically about this one. So the upside to this compared to a jig that you build yourself is, one, you don't have to build anything, and two, you can use it to cut a variety of different angles. The downside, conversely, is it'll cost you a little bit more, and while it can be as accurate at getting an exact 90, you'll have to verify each time that you make an adjustment. So there are positive stops that should pretty much lock it in, but you'll still probably want to double check just to make sure. And the other tool that's pretty similar that's on my list is a miter gauge. So I've tried two different miter gauges in my time, not including the ones that come with your saw, and that's one from Incra and another one from Craig. And both, I would say, are honestly equally good. They're each a little different, but the basic advantage is, compared with the other two, you can cut a lot more angles with increased accuracy. And I'd say the downside is they're a little bit slower. So basically at the end of the day, if you look at the three, they would kind of plot out like this in terms of speed versus what I'll call angle versatility. And really, I personally think that while all three can be used for similar things, I like having all three at my disposal and I use each tool pretty frequently. Like I'd say that in almost every project I build, I'll employ all three types of jigs. So it's really not a one or the other kind of situation. Okay, next on my list is a tapering jig. And again, you can build or buy these. Personally, I've always had good luck with this one from Rockler, so I'm gonna highly recommend it. But if you wanna check out a video on building one, Dustin Penner has a really good video that explains it in less words than me saying, linked below. But anyway, these are really handy for cutting, you guessed it, tapers. So if you're familiar with my other videos, you know that I'm big on tapered splayed legs. And this jig is such a huge time saver, it really makes me kick myself for waiting like five years to get one. So many wasted hours. But anyway, here's a project that I'm actually working on at the moment, and this will let you know why you might or might not need one. So in this shot, I'm marking out my tapers. I want this particular leg to go from three quarters of an inch at the bottom to two inches at the top. Next, I fit my piece on my jig and adjust it so that the lines that I marked are just barely hanging off the edge, which you would have trimmed to your saw right when you get it. So basically, you know that's where the cut's gonna happen. And then you just cut. And since everything's locked in, you can cut out three or four or more of these legs really easily, as long as they're already cut to the same length. And that's pretty much it. It's a one-trick pony, I guess, but it's a pony that's the star of my show, so yeah, makes sense to me. Okay, the next jig on my list is one that I don't really know a name for. 
It's kind of like a tenoning jig, but I don't use it for making tenons, so I like to call it a vertical panel carrying jig. So first let me show you why it's important for me and what it does, and then I'll show you how to build one. So you guys know I like angular stuff. One of the most angular pieces is this guy, Bad Larry. I'll link him below if you haven't already seen the build video. Anyway, so I use this jig in order to make the trapezoidal cabinet, and here's why I need it. As you can see, all of these corners are mitered or beveled. To achieve this joint, I set my blade at 37 and a half degrees and cut the two edges. And this results in an overall angle that's obtuse at 105 degrees, or 15 degrees more than 90. So that's all pretty easy and straightforward. But to cut this corner, I would have to tilt my blade at 52 and a half degrees. The problem is you can't tilt a blade to 52 and a half degrees. So the trick is leaving your blade tilted to 37 and a half degrees, like it was for those first two cuts, and instead make your workpiece run across the blade vertically, instead of horizontally, or flat on the table. And that's why you need this jig. So yeah, let's build it. We're going to start by ripping some pieces of 3 quarter inch plywood so that they're the exact same height as your fence. Again, I'd recommend airing on the side of taller and then working your way down until it's just right. And once you have it locked in, you're going to need a total of two pieces that are this size. And you might notice here that I'm making more than two, and that's because I'm making multiple jigs, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Here I'm just cross cutting my pieces to length, and you can do this before or after. But generally speaking, I like to go anywhere from 3 fourths of the length to the full length of my fence. And this is pretty variable in reality, but it just kind of depends on what you're going to be using the jig for. Here I'm sandwiching my fence between the two pieces that I cut in step one, and then measuring how wide of a piece I need to cut for the top. And then I could cut that piece out and glue and screw it on. The next thing to do was attach the flat face of the jig to the carriage. So this is the part that your workpiece is going to end up attaching to. And again here, just a few screws should do the trick. Now like I said, I made three of these jigs while I was out there, and that's because I use these things a lot, and so I want to have one dedicated to making splines in mitered leg joints that are 90 degrees, and then another one for legs that are 15 degrees off of 90. So here I'm setting up for that in this shot. And actually, here's some footage from some other builds that kind of shows what you'd use something like this for. Alright, so here I'm cutting out some plywood strips and then making a 45 degree cross cut with my miter gauge and then I can attach those to the vertical piece. So now you kind of know how they all work, but I'm just going to show a really extreme example of the vertical panel carrying jig here. And you can see that this would be a really difficult or dangerous cut to try to make without the jig. Alright, so moving on. One of the questions that I get asked most often is how I get clean cuts on the table saw. And there's a lot of factors that are going to go into it, but two of the most important in my book, and the two that I usually ask people first about are, one, what kind of blade they're using, and two, are they using a zero clearance insert plate. So for blades, there's lots of good ones out there, and my personal favorites are Forest Woodworker 2 blades, which are kind of on the pricey side, but I see it as an investment, honestly. I have a total of three of them now that I still currently use, and I've owned some of them for over seven years. And one of the reasons for that is because you can send them back to Forest to have them resharpened and fixed up for about 30 bucks. But I guess the bottom line is there's plenty of options out there, and you should just research and explore those options rather than settling on whatever your saw happened to come with. Okay, so about the zero clearance insert plate. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to install a new one in my saw right here, and it'll be pretty self-explanatory. So as you can see right now, it's just a solid plate with no slot for the blade. Once you have it inserted and balanced, and you make sure that your riving knife or splitter is removed, 
you clamp it down, turn on your saw, and slowly raise the blade through it. So this is going to cut a slot that's the exact same size as the blade, which means that the underside of your piece that you're cutting is going to get a lot more support and should have less tear out. And I think for most table saws, you should be able to buy an insert plate that's already made to fit it exactly, but if you needed to, you could also make one. If it's an option though, I'd honestly recommend buying because it's probably going to get a better fit. Alright, so these next two recommendations have more to do with confidence and comfort while working, but I think that those are things that go into making you get a good result, so they're worth mentioning. So number nine is a feather board. And what feather boards allow you to do is keep good consistent pressure of your workpiece up against your fence. And they can also get places where it would be kind of dangerous to put your hands. Also, they can kind of act as a third hand in situations where you might be cutting a piece that's too big to reach. And one of the other things that I use them for a lot is when I run a piece on edge over the table saw, for example, when I'm cutting rabbits. Basically, it helps the piece from tilting. And last but not least, and this might seem really obvious, is a good push stick. Now, these come in all different shapes and sizes, everything from as simple as what probably came with your saw to something like a gripper from microjigs. But honestly, my favorite is something like this, a push shoe. I saw this design somewhere like seven years ago, and so I drew up a file in Illustrator and had six of them cut out on a CNC from a local sign shop, and these are my favorite. They let me keep good pressure on my workpiece, they keep my hands up and away from the blade, and since they're made out of wood and relatively cheap, I don't mind cutting right into them if I need to to help me get more pressure on certain cuts. So that's it. Those are my 10 favorite jigs and accessories for the table saw in no particular order. So hopefully you found it useful, and if this was your first time to my channel, if you got a couple minutes, go check out some of my build videos, and I thank you in advance. Alright, see you in the next one.